Well, good morning, Central. How's everyone doing? If, if we've not met, my name is Steve Carter, part of the teaching team here. And uh, if you're watching at Queen Creek with the hometown hero, your pastor, Eric Eman, or you got Steve Hutchins and Tempe, you got the legend Perry Emmerich in Mesa, or Dean Keese to the kingdom out in Glendale, or you're watching online, let me just tell you, like I was last week, if you're watching online, you missed out on getting an envelope of cash. How did that feel last week? I heard that an eighth grader was like sitting over here and he opened it up and he's like, I'm rich. And then I was watching online going, I'm not. Uh, it's Super Bowl Sunday. Who do you got? If you got the Rams, put it in the chat room. If you got the Bengals, put it in all caps. Who do you got? You think the Rams? You think the Bengals? Who you got? Bengals. I love you. Oh, you're all like... Just can't stand the lambs, like the lambs being led to a slaughter. I hope it happens. I hope it happens. I don't think it does, but I hope it happens. Hey, speaking of the Super Bowl, and we're in this series called In God We Trust, because seriously, I think we all, we all can learn principles to make our money behave. And if you're like me, it just gets a little bit tricky. But speaking about the NFL, did you know that 78% of NFL players go through bankruptcy or find themselves in severe financial stress within two years of retirement. And we're talking seven, eight figures. Some guys even nine figures. Warren Sapp, John Elway, Dan Marino. Big names. Within two years of retirement, creditors are calling. And it's not just the NFL. 60% of NBA players. And I'm just here to tell you, man, this... This concept of money, for many of us, I know it feels a lot of shade or shame or personal judgment, but I think if you're like me, many of us just weren't taught how to handle money or how to make money behave. And that's my hope. I love what Rachel Cruz said a couple of weeks ago about debt. She says, debt is owing anything to anyone for any reason. And the truth is 80% of Americans have consumer debt, 80%. The 20%, I think, are kids under the age of 12 who can't get a credit card. <laughs> 80%, 50% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. I'd be like half this room, paycheck to paycheck. And the average consumer debt is $38,000 within the American household. That excludes mortgages. That's credit, that's car, that's student loans. 38,000. It doesn't seem like that much because we've normalized debt, haven't we? I remember when I was in college, I worked at Kmart. Remember that? Let's go. I used to always ask my, my general manager, hey, can I do the blue light special? He's like, no. When he wasn't there, I'd go to the associate manager, manager and she was like, yeah, you can. And I just walk up and I was like, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to report we have a blue light special in aisle three and people lost their ever loving minds. They ran to aisle three. And then sometimes I got to work, not just in stocking shelves, but I got to work in something called layaway. Remember that? If you don't, cause I know there's some young people over here. They're like, what's that? That's where you would literally go. I would like to buy this Huffy bike or this dishwasher, but I can't pay for it. I can't pay for the whole thing. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna actually give it to you. You put it in the back storage room. And so I'd walk the Huffy bike to the back. And then every week, I'm just gonna pay you nine bucks. And at the end of 20 weeks, I'm gonna walk out with a brand new Huffy bike. And people were so proud. Layaway was awesome. We think of that concept today and we're like, that's crazy. Let's just erase and eliminate the middleman. And you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna give you a credit card. And now you can get it right now. And instead of just paying 180 bucks for that Huffy bike, over a lifetime, you can pay $750. <laughs> and by the time you pay off that Huffy bike, you've already got it stolen or lost it. It's crazy. This is, this is how we live. We've normalized it. So I'm gonna make this uber practical because I like math. And here's what I want you to see. My, my job here today is to teach you God's word. I think it's pastoral malpractice when we are not honest, not just about spiritual debt that Jesus rescued us from, but what the Bible has to say about financial debt and how God wants to rescue us from that. Because God wants you to live at peace with him, with yourself, 
with each other and with creation. That's the hope. So let's do a little math because I know you're fired up. It's 930. Let's do some math. Here it is. If you have a $15,000 credit card, the average I think is $14,998. If you have a $15,000 credit card, and that's the debt. And let's say the average interest rate right now is 14.96%. And you pay the minimum each month. The minimum each month, let's say 3% is your minimum payment each month. So 15 times 3%, that comes up to $450. You pay that. Here's my question for you. How long? Just by paying the minimum. Will it take you to pay off the debt? I have five years. Someone said 20 years. Here it is. 227 months. <clears throat> That's one month short of 19 years. Now, now let's do the math here. You've paid off your 15000 but in interest, you've actually paid $12,978. So what you bought, you thought was only 15K, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's only 28,000. That's a deal, friends. Let's go. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about even more. Did you know that the US, the US, in credit card consumer debt, we have $930 billion. That's how much we all have in debt. $930 billion. So let's do some math. Let's erase eight zeros. And let's just say 9,300. 9,300, we'll say it like similar to the 15,000. That's 62% of 15,000. So if they were paying 3% and, and 450 bucks a month on a $15,000 card, on a $9,300 card at 3%, you would pay 279. Okay, 279. And what I want you to see here, 279, and now let's add back the eight zeros we took off. That's $27.9 billion each month we're just paying to who? The man. And who's the man? His name is JP Morgan. But he goes by Chase. You know what's so great about Chase? That's who I bank with. That's who I bank with. But Chase tricked me. No, no, no lie. They tricked me. You know what? They gave me a credit card. You know what they called the credit card? The freedom card. <laughs> we are here to enrich your life while we enslave you. And you love it. That's crazy, isn't it? You're going to go watch this Super Bowl today. And here's what's going to happen. You're going to watch a three-hour game. But you're also going to watch nine hours worth of commercials. And you know what the commercials are going to try and do? They're going to try and get in your head and say, you need Doritos. You need this Ford Bronco with four doors. It's unbelievable. You need this new technology. And you know what? You're watching for 30 seconds. And that company has paid $3 million for a 30-second spot to try and get you to go to their website and hopefully click buy. That's what we do. And oftentimes we do with money we don't have. And friends, I know what Rachel Cruz said. She grabbed this whole thing of chains. And she's like, many of us were just enslaved. And she's right. And the way that I think about it, the way that my wife and I think about it is, you know what debt really is? It's prolonged shame. It's prolonged shame. And the, and the reason it's prolonged shame is because many of us don't talk about it. And you know what Brene Brown says. She's someone who, who studies shame. She says that shame thrives in secrecy, silence, and judgment. And for many of us, even in the church family, we don't know how to talk about debt. Because underneath it, it just feels like I shouldn't have this. I should be better with my money. I shouldn't live paycheck to paycheck. I want to be someone who's generous, but I just don't know how to do it. And so all of a sudden, debt just keeps creeping in. And then you got Jeff Bezos who goes, oh, I know. I see you. You're having a hard day. That's why we created the one click button on Amazon. And you're just having a bad day. And for some apparent reason, you're like, I do need a lawn gnome. One click purchase. Why? I don't know. But I just clicked it. And by the time you're like, what was I thinking? It's already been delivered to your house. <laughs> just adding on to the debt. With something I don't need. Don't want. Just feeling the sense of prolonged Shame. So what I want to do for remaining time is I want to open up God's word. Because again, I think God wants you to experience profound peace. And when you open up God's word, I think it teaches us. 
It's ancient wisdom. It's true. It's how we can walk an honest relationship with God, trusting him, trusting how he created us. And so if you have a Bible, turn with me to Philippians chapter four. Philippians, this was this church in Philippi. And honestly, this whole area of Macedonia where this church was, they were going through severe hardship. But Paul was so surprised by even in the midst of profound difficulty, this church had such a profound understanding of the death, the burial, the resurrection of of Jesus that they like begged Paul for the opportunity to be generous. And Paul was like trying to give them an out and they were frustrated so much so that when Paul writes to the church in Corinth who had a whole bunch, he goes, You all think you understand grace? You think you understand generosity? Let me tell you about the Macedonians. Let me tell you about the Philippian church. Let me tell you about my friends in Queen Creek who can be generous. Like that, that's that's what he was doing. He was actually trying to make church compete with another church on who's more generous. But his understanding was who actually gets the real understanding of what Jesus did for you. And it's not just for your spiritual debt. It's for all of you so that you can be generous with grace and forgiveness, but generous with your money, generous with your time, generous with your thought life for another person. And so Paul begins to write about this and he, he kind of towards the end of chapter four ushers some wisdom that I think is so, so important for right here, right now. Philippians chapter four, it says this, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances Just put that up on your mirror. I've learned to be content, okay, whatever the circumstances are. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me Strength. Now, the word content was actually like this stoic word. It's only mentioned once in scripture, this kind of area. And, and Paul's really like taking it. He's taking it from culture and he's trying to say, hey, they don't own this. This concept is actually true to how God actually designed us to live. That we would learn the secret of Atarix. The secret of contentment. And this idea of being content was this sacred, satisfying sense of shalom. And shalom is just peace here within, peace here on earth. In layman's terms, what contentment means is to be able to exhale. Because you're so at peace. But I think for many of us, we're more stressed we're more overwhelmed. We're more anxious. We got secrets when it comes to money. We're silent about it. We don't know how to ask for help. We feel this personal judgment. And friends, I'm telling you, being in debt is prolonged shame, but being content is prolonged shalom. And this is what God wants for you. God wants for you to be so at peace so that when money comes, you're like, God, how can we use this to bless another? How can we use this to bless our kids? How can we use this to bless a family member? How can we use this to bless someone in our neighbor? How can we be generous because you were generous with me? But when we have $28 billion each month going to banks, it's hard for our culture to be generous. And when we have many of us not walking in a prolonged sense of shalom and exhale, this sacred, satisfying sense of shalom, but we're walking in stress and anxiety and shame, How beautiful is that to be around? So what I want to do is I want to now take you back to the ancient Near East. I want to take you back to just one bizarre passage, but it had deep, deep meaning, deep, deep understanding that I think is wildly practical for you and me, whether you're watching in Tempe or Queen Creek, Glendale, or here in Gilbert. It's for us. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Proverbs chapter 22. It's in the the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. If you got to Malachi, you've gone too far. Proverbs 22, 28, one verse simply says this. Do not move an ancient boundary stone set up by your ancestors. Which you're like, of course he's going to talk about debt. He's talking about boundary stones. Now, here's what I got. 
I got four stools, which are going to represent exactly what the Hebrew culture did with boundary stones. Not so much. But here's the idea. You all, if you own a home, when you went to closing, you were all excited and they made you sign your life away and all these documents. And then there was this moment where they showed you how much your land you actually have. And for some of you, it's 6,000 square feet. For some of you, it's 10,000 square feet. For some of you, it's 25,000 square feet. For some of you, it's like 1.5 acres or seven acres. But this is your land. And there are these markers that mark your land and your neighbor's land. This is yours. You could plant on it. You could put up a big Michigan flag and celebrate the greatest college football team. You, you can do whatever you want to in your land. It's your land. Now, in the ancient Near East, though, in the middle of the night, what people would do is they'd walk over and they would just start to stretch the boundary stone because they wanted a little bit more of their neighbor's land. They wanted a little bit more. And so they were like, man, you know what? Like that, that area is really, really fertile. I'm just, I just, yeah, I'm just gonna do this. And what's amazing is they move from a place of contentment, which is like the satisfying sense of shalom to a word that's very similar to content. It's too contentious. And the idea of contentious is when you stretch yourself against your neighbor. And truth be told, many of us, this is what we do, right? We find ourselves just going, ah, oh, God, you haven't given me enough. God, I need more. I don't, I don't, like, I don't like the fact that my neighbor seems like he's winning. I don't like the fact that they seem like they have more. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to stretch myself and stretch myself. And then all of a sudden, I find myself in this prolonged sense of shame. And culture's like, keep going, keep stretching, keep stretching, keep stretching. You've got more in you, keep stretching. And many of us are just dying. And so what I wanna do is I wanna kinda teach you how you can literally understand money, because money is a prop. That's all money is. It's a prop. It's kind of like junior high. It's a necessary evil. You got to go. You got to talk about it. You can't skip junior high. It's a necessary evil. Money is a necessary evil. You, you, you got to understand how to, how to make it behave. But for many of us, it's owning us. And for me, it's just a prop. It's just a tool. It's just a prop. But that prop has profound meaning. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about this. Around this whole idea that you have been entrusted with the plot of land. Every single one of you, whether you're a homeowner or not, you have a plot of land. So here it is. The first point, the secret of contentment requires defining and deciding your reality with money. <clears throat> this has never happened to me. I like, got a dry mouth. I'm in the desert. I thought it was a dry heat. So the secret of contentment, <clears throat> this is so embarrassing. Wow. Requires defining and deciding your reality with money. Now, I love words, and words are fascinating to me. So you got define and decide. Define in the original understanding in Latin literally meant to completely understand the limits. So when you define something, you are basically breaking down, here are the limits. Now decide, decide's even more fascinating. Because side is like also where we play off the word homicide, right? Decide literally means something has to die or be cut off. So every time you decide something, when you decided to be married to him or her, you were cutting off and said, I'm dead to everybody else. She or he will be with me. So defining is understanding, oh, here are my limits. Deciding is saying, I'm going to cut off and do it a new way. Okay? So the secret of contentment is you have to define. You have to decide your reality with money. And here's what I mean. When I talk about the reality of money, and nobody taught me this early on. Nobody taught me this. But all of a sudden, you got to understand what is the reality that comes in every month. And for some of you, it's 4,000 bucks a month. Fantastic. It's awesome. 
Some of you, it's $8,000 a month. Some of you, it's $15,000 a month. Some of you, it's $50,000 a month, which I want to be your friend, <laughs> right? But that's awesome. You got to understand what is coming in. You got to have reality. You got to define that reality, but you also got to decide how much will I allow to go out? It's very, very simple, super practical. How much comes in? How much goes out? How much comes in? How much goes out? And the problem is when 50% of America are living paycheck to paycheck, most people do not have budgets. So they don't actually know how much land they have. They're hoping, I hope a check comes. I hope grandma passes and just sends me a random check. I hope, I hope. But the truth is, you gotta actually define and decide it. You gotta make money behave. And if you don't do that, I guarantee you, marketers, commercials, culture, they're gonna force you to stretch. And for many of us, we're just okay with stretching rather than doing the harder work to define and decide. Second, the secret of contentment. That sacred, satisfying sense of shalom, a secret of contentment, this means you gotta define and decide your relationship with money. See, there's a reality. How much comes in, how much goes out. How much comes in, how much goes out. But there's a relationship with money. And here's the truth. I said it earlier. Money's just a prop. Remember many of you who would go to, on a high school Friday night, go to a party, and then someone would hand you a solo red cup and what was in that cup didn't matter. It mattered, but it didn't matter. But what that cup represented was something about your identity, how you saw yourself. It was just a red solo cup. Sure, there might be alcohol in there, but it's just a red solo cup. But what that cup said, if you took it, was I need this to be seen by them. If I drink this, then I might be accepted. It wasn't just what was in the cup. It was what the cup actually told you about you. So now, find yourself at Nordstrom. And I like Nordstrom. I like those Nordies, those points. You walk into Nordstrom. You got someone who's super nice. They're like, man, you, you, you got a good fit. I'm like, no, I don't. Don't try that on me. I know I have not been to the gym. Don't give me that. But they start talking to you. They try it on. They bring someone who alters it and they put it on and, and you don't even know the price tag. But all of a sudden you're just thinking about it. You're thinking about it. I mean, how am I be see, someone might see me with this label, this brand. And all of a sudden it's like, wow. And then it gets to the price and you, you find it because they, they hide it in the back and you can't really get to it. Finally you get to it and you're like, oh my goodness. It's like the GDP of a third world country right there. And then you're like, man, like, what am I going to do? And then you're like, I'm, I'm so pot committed. I've just wasted this guy's time. That guy just altered it and checkered it all up. Like, I, I got to, and you just feel like, I, now I got to like make this person happy that I don't even know. And I need this for them to actually think I got money. And so you remember freedom. I got freedom. Chase gave me freedom. <laughs> and then you go, Boom. And they're like, man, you just gained yourself 30 nerdy points. And I don't even know what that means, but it feels good. <laughs> and I leave, more in debt. I'm telling you this because like, it's not about the clothes, but the clothes are a prop. It's not about credit, the credit's a prop. And the question is, why do I need this? And why do I need you to think I have it all together? And why do I need to like actually pretend or perform, I try and please someone. Why, why do I gotta look perfect? Why do I gotta perform? And little by little, we just run ourselves in debt and we're stretching because we want everybody else to seemingly think we have more than we actually do. And then all of a sudden, Ford drops a brand new car, a Ford Bronco, four doors all black, lifted, black rims. It looks amazing. And every time someone drives by it, and I, I like visualize myself in that car. 
And then here's the truth. My mentor used to say this to me all the time. You can admire it, but you don't have to acquire it. That'll preach. And so I, I admire it. I visualize myself in it. My like Joel Osteen hair going everywhere. I'm driving it. Like it's fantastic. It's fantastic. But, but here's the thing. That, that Ford Bronco, which is awesome, it might cost 60000 But if I do all the payments, how much am I really paying for that car? 84000 That's like one year. At some college for my kid now. That's crazy. But you think about this, right? Money, money is just this, this absolute prop. And oftentimes I see something and I go, man, if I had that, then I think, what will those people think? Well, what would people think if I actually tried to put myself in debt so that I could get people to like me? Or to get people to think better of me? Or to get people to think I have more than I actually have? This is America. And this is, I think for many of us, we're acting and making decisions because we have not learned that secret of contentment, that sacred, satisfying sense of shalom. And so we keep stretching and performing and pleasing and trying to act like we have it more. And what's dying is our soul. I just don't want that for you. The secret of contentment requires being done with debt for good. And I can't decide that for you. I can't define that for you. All I can tell you is my own personal experience. I see, I I was a kid, I remember, usually it was the last week of the month, somewhere between the 23rd and 27th. I was 12 years old, I'm out in the driveway and I'm just working on my shot. Working on my shot, that's a good shot. I'm working on my shot. The home phone rings, remember those? <laughs> I, I knew the home phone rung. I didn't have a cell phone at the time because I was too old now. And I just go inside. I bring my basketball in, I dribble in the house, nobody's home. I pick up the phone, it was one of my parents. One of my parents says, hey, 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 has the mail come yet? I'm like, I don't know, I haven't checked. Well, go check. Okay, I'll call you back. No, no, just go get the mail, come back. I go outside, get the mail, come back. Yeah, here it is. What, what came? I have some coupons. Uh, something from like a, we got a doctor's appointment coming up, uh, something from American Express, something from Nordstrom's, something from Visa. And then one of the parents would say, okay, take those last three and go hide those and put them like uh, where we keep all the fine plates. So, okay. And I would go and hide them. I just was 12 years old. I could tell that Visa and American Express triggered a parent. And kids are very perceptive. They're just not always the best interpreters of reality. But when money would be talked about at home, it was World War III. My parents would fight and they'd scream and they'd yell and words like divorce were thrown out. So money as a kid became super, super stressful. I didn't have anyone who pulled me by the shoulder and just walked me and said, hey, I'm gonna give you a map for how to deal with money. Basically, I was told three words, figure it out. And I didn't know. So I just became super secretive with money. I bought things that I didn't know. I show up to college and I go to Cal State Fullerton and Hope International and I'm walking and someone just says, hey, you need a credit card? I'm like, I don't know what that is. It's free money, free money. Easy, I get a credit card. Within a few years, I had racked up $47,000 in credit cards. And you know how much money I made for that year? Less than 30. This is gonna be an awesome story. I'm, I'm set to be a pastor to set people free of their spiritual debt. And I was good at it, I was good at it. And all the while I kept thinking, well, someday, someday maybe I'll get like a, a real job like at the church and it'll pay me really well. Maybe you'll get bonuses in church. That doesn't happen. Maybe like something will happen, <laughs> right? Maybe I'll be sitting next, next to the pool like Pastor Cal talked about. <laughs> Someone will take care of all my <laughs> debt. I just sat here myself and I just was like, I don't, I don't want to do this. And my life just was getting more anxious and I was hiding and had secrets and personal judgment. And just, just honestly, 
Any of you relate? It's when you see that phone call come in from a creditor, phone call come in from American Express or Visa, Capital One. It's not Samuel L. Jackson calling you. <laughs> All right? And you just feel that. My friends, all this headspace and heart space and real estate wasn't about ways in which I could be generous or see the good news expand. It was all about this prolonged shame. And it wasn't until I saw an older, wiser person, a mentor, and I just said, hey, I need help. And this older, wiser person came alongside me and taught me. And anytime I'm in a money series, I ask to teach about debt. Because I know, I know the pain that it causes families. I know the pain it brings upon a man. I know that even as a pastor who can preach good news can actually feel the shame of decisions that were made. And I just want to teach you just for the last few moments, if any of you were like me, $47,000 in credit card debt, I just want to share with you what a mentor taught me that became super helpful, that allowed me to understand the secret of contentment. First one was this. He told me, you got to get a plan. You got to get a plan. You got to get a plan. And here's the plan. You got to define and decide how much comes in, how much goes out. You got to get a plan. You got to be really, really crystal clear how much comes in, how much goes out. Number two, you got to ask for help. You got to ask for help. I mean, we do this when we go to Home Depot, don't we? Few places make me more anxious than going to Home Depot. Because I feel like I should know how to build something, and I don't. And you know what I pray? I pray as I go to the Home Depot parking lot, Lord, father me through this. And you know what he does? He provides me with the nicest old woman or man in an orange apron. And you know what they tell me? You can do it. We can help. I just have to ask. And I've spent 90 minutes looking for one little part, and then I ask one person, and they're like, oh yeah, aisle 28. Do you know what you're doing? No. Well, let me show you how to do it. We just have to ask for help. And for many of us, we're trying to do this without a map. And so asking this mentor, can you help me? He's like, yeah, totally. Number three, you gotta get a plan. You gotta ask for help. Number three, you gotta be accountable. You have to be accountable. And here's the crazy thing about Christians. Can I just say it? Because I am one. Here's the crazy thing. We go to small group and what do we talk about? How was your week? Oh, so good. So good. Johnny went for nine points in the eighth grade basketball game. Great week, great week. How about you? Oh, so good, so good. Had dinner three nights a week with the whole family. Oh, it's great. What do we not talk about? Our relationship to power, sex, purity, and money. Talk about that in your small group. Now you got a life group. <laughs> right? When you actually show up and say, hey, hey, here's the deal, here's the deal, here's where I'm struggling. Because money became like an addiction to me. And the truth is we're all addicts. We just have socially more acceptable vices. And debt has become wildly socially acceptable. Way more than meth, but they're both dangerous. And the truth is, the truth is we have to be the kind of people who go, I'm gonna be accountable. And it wasn't until I got so serious where I showed up to my small group and I said, here are the four credit card statements. Totals $47,000. If I'm gonna be set free, I need you to ask me, did you spend any money with money that you did not have this week? And I either gotta lie to you or be honest with you. They're like, we can do that. That was not fun. But I knew that those guys were gonna help me understand the secret of contentment. And then my mentor said, you got to do the snowball effect. And I said, what do I do? He said, snowball effect is you look at those four bills and what is the lowest? $800 is the lowest. Great. You take and you put all your energy, pay the minimum, pay all your extra money, pay off that 800, then roll it over and then go to the second lowest and pay that whole thing off and then roll that over, pay all of that off. And in 30 and 42 months, 42 months, I said yes to extra speaking. I worked my tail off. My wife worked her tail off. And in 42 months, 
We knocked out those four credit cards. And you know what we did when we did? When we finally got free, we exhaled. Because there's no credit to calling. There's nobody, nobody asking. There's no like paycheck to paycheck. We literally just had this moment where we were free. And you know what we said? Never again. I just don't want that. Ever again. So you got to get a plan. You got to ask for help. You got to be accountable. You got to do the little snowball effect. That was helpful for me. They also say the avalanche effect is where you start at the biggest amount and try to pay off. But I think that's harder. Go, go small because you know why? Lastly, you got to celebrate the wins. And the wins, when you actually pay something off, think about this going, man, if we do this and we do this well, like let's imagine us just celebrating and being free. And friends, I believe, I believe, I believe that God created us to be free. I believe, I believe that God wants you not just to be spiritually free, but debt free. I believe that God wants us to be gracious with forgiveness and gracious and generous with our finances. I believe, but you have to decide and you have to define is today the day. And just imagine this. What if in four years you look back and go, dude, on February 13th, 2022, when the Bengals beat the Rams, it was a defining moment. A defining moment where all of a sudden I and my spouse and partner, we made the decision to be free and we worked it. And you fast forward that generationally, what that means for your kids, what that means for your grandkids, and what that means for the peace at the kitchen table. And instead of like tending to the crazy of creditors, you can tend to the presence of Christ in your home. I want that for you. So make today be the day where you decide and you define to live with the secret of contentment. God, I pray right now for my friends. For many of us, we know what that prolonged sense of shame is. not feeling like we have enough and we're barely making it and we just feel like we're stuck in a hole. And God, I'm grateful for a church like Central that really wants to help enrich people's lives and not enslave them. And so God, I'm asking right now that you would do what you can do, whisper and prompt to the hearts and the minds and encourage my friends to get a plan, to ask for help, to be accountable, to put that snowball effect in play and celebrate the wins and discover the secret of contentment. We love you, God. We trust you. We're so grateful for grace and the peace. May it be true in every area of our life. And all God's people said, amen. Thanks everyone. Here's our campus pastor, John.